You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. Hi, I'm Jennifer Wood. And I'm Jennifer Connor. I'm Equestrian Businesswoman, and you're listening to Equestrian B2B, the podcast that brings together industry leaders, entrepreneurs, and equestrians for conversations about how they build and sustain a successful business. On today's show, we speak to Linda Hawk of Tapestry Equine Products, Inc. about how she started her business, how passion and storytelling lead to sales, expanding into international markets, and why patents are important. Linda Hawk has been passionate about eventing and thoroughbreds for as long as she has ridden. Linda started riding at the age of 14 and in 1983 was a member of the Junior Ontario three-day event team. In 1984, she achieved her A-level in Pony Club, and in 1987, she was sponsored as a top junior to train in Virginia with Olympian Torrance Watkins. By 1990, Linda was competing in eventing at the advanced level with Steeplechase and had yet to own her own horse. Her career led to getting her thoroughbred trainer's racing license and winners such as stakes winner My Imperial Gem. Linda is a Level 3 Technical Delegate in Eventing and an Equine Canada Level 2 Competition Coach. Thousands of hours watching and riding horses has inspired her product designs, and in 2009, she launched her first patented product, the Spur Suader Spur. As the first product of her manufacturing company, Tapestry Equine Products, Inc., As founder and CEO, Linda launched her second game-changing product, the internationally patented Tapestry Comfort Girth, in 2016. She travels to trade shows around the world growing her brand, meeting fascinating and helpful people along the way. In addition to wearing all the hats for Tapestry Equine Products, Inc., Linda is the Canadian sales representative for Shire's Equestrian. Linda has a Bachelor's of Science degree from the University of Guelph, with a major in wildlife biology. Her daughter, Jasmine, also an accomplished equestrian, is in her fourth year of studies at Queen's University. Are you an industry professional who has thought about writing a book? Bookending your business enhances credibility and creates powerful marketing opportunities. InCourse Publishing can bring your expertise to the printed page. As a hybrid publishing company, we partner with our authors through editing, designing, printing, and distribution. Don't leave opportunity on the shelf. Bookend your business today and let us bring your book into the unique arena of the equestrian market. Visit our website, incoursepublishing.com, to download a free PDF to help get you started. Hi, Linda. We're so happy to have you here today uh, to talk about you and your business and learn more about how you've grown it. Um, And we'll get right into it with the first question. So, Linda, we were wondering what the inspiration behind you starting Tapestry Equine Products was. Well, thank you very much for in, inviting me on, ladies, because it is it's it is quite the story. Um, so my inspiration uh, came from wanting really to make horses more comfortable when they when they were being ridden. Um, I've been in the industry, the equine industry, for over forty years in in many capacities as a high level rider, as a trainer, as a coach, official. Um, I trained thoroughbred race horses and. With the first product, the 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 Spur Suader Spur, just watching how horses reacted negatively most of the time to a traditional spur. So that was really my the impetus for getting getting this going was okay. How can I make the horses happier under saddle? Mm, I really like that. Me too. And just a little idea like that can spark such a such a big thing, and that's that's cool to see it grow. Um, do you think, I mean, obviously, I think all of your your experience in the industry before that helped you um, and prepared you to run a business. Um, but did you have a lot of like business management experience before starting Tapestry? So actually, I had none. Uh, my degree is in wildlife biology. So oh, wow. cool. <laughs> uh, sales, marketing, business, I had n- no experience with any of that beforehand. But mm. so I had the product and it was one of those journeys where I never got stopped along the way. So then, you know, from a gut feeling that, you know what, I'm doing something right. Keep going. Mm-hmm. So, for example, when I had the idea in my head, 
Um, I had a lovely big thoroughbred at the time. Uh, we done, we did very well in eventing, but my God, man, I would have never put a traditional spur on him. Just he was opinionated and, and, uh, and all that, you know, that can go along with some of these guys and rightly so they have their, they have their personalities too, but a next door neighbor had his own tool and die. And so I had the idea of what I wanted the spur to look like. So I said, do me a favor. Can you make me a prototype of this? And I need to try it and, and see if it does what I think it should. And lo and behold, he made me my prototype, put it on that, that big thoroughbred, started warming him up, doing the lateral work, and his ears never moved. And I thought, okay, that's brilliant. So that was kind of the first thing. Then um, I went into a tax store one day and I said, hey, guys, like how important is packaging? <laughs> he looked at me <laughs> Yeah, Linda. <laughs> uh, it's the first thing we see at a trade show. So I'm thinking, yeah. oh my God, I know nothing about this. So I, I did a Google search for packaging and marketing or something. And this beautiful website came up and I live in Ontario in Canada. And I thought, oh God, who knows where this is going to be? I'm thinking somewhere in California or whatever, half an hour from my house. Oh, wow. And that's how I met um, the gentleman who, no horse experience, designed my my logos, my coloring, and all that kind of stuff. I took him to a tax store one day, and I said, here's the spur section. (laughs) And he picked up a package of spurs and went, oh, my God, look, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. So for me, that was a huge lesson in you don't need horse people to tell you how to do a horse business or at least all aspects of it. Right. You know, I, I was the horse person, but you know what? I need you for marketing and I need you to, you know, create my logo. And he's the gentleman. So if you, if you see my persuader logo, the very end of the S is actually the, the contact surface of the spur. And he came up with the tagline, the art of gentle persuasion. <laughs> and so again, just a fantastic story of, you don't need to understand everything about a business, but find the people that do. And then the next biggest thing that happened for me, when I launched the product at Ada back in the day, when it was uh, down at uh, King of Prussia, I had my booth and in walks a British gentleman. And he goes, wow, these are different. Do you need distribution in the UK? Mm-hmm. And oh, by the way, I'm a manufacturer. Oh, well, that was the founder of Shire's Equestrian, Malcolm Ainge. Yeah. Oh, cool. okay. And so ever since 2010, Shires oversees all my manufacturing and uh, they, without them, I, I don't know what I would have done because, you know, sourcing manufacturing could certainly be a big part of um, complicating someone's uh, business plan, sure. shall we say. But it's just funny how things kept falling in place for me. And I just thought, okay, well, the universe is helping me out. Yeah. That you know, it's meant to be when those things just line up and happen. Yeah, that's. I think the that recurring theme of finding people to help you do the things that you don't know how to do, or you're not best at doing, or you don't want to do, that really um, has come across in a lot of our episodes from our guests. That you shouldn't be able to do it all. Nobody can do it all. So. Mm-hmm. Um, I love that you were able to find somebody who could handle such a big part of it because manufacturing, man, that is from everyone who we've talked to from apparel and, and supplies. That's one of the most difficult things to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It yeah. really is. Yeah. I mean, coming from a pharmaceutical industry, that's a manufacturer of drugs. I definitely get that it, there's so many steps and so many processes and so many rules. So having mm-hmm. that fall into place, that's like really amazing that mm-hmm. you were able to have that happen. And I definitely believe that those kind of things, um, you know, are signs that you're going in the right direction. So that is <laughs> super cool. <laughs> yeah. How long I, was that? Like the, the time period from when you got your prototype to when you met the man from Shires, how, how long of a time was that? I'm going to say maybe a year. Oh, wow. Like, honestly, nothing got nothing stopped me along the way. You know, I got the prototype, I tried it, I put it on people, mm-hmm. met the marketing gentleman who designed the the individual packing and the desktop display, put it all together. And at that time, product was made in Ontario. Mm-hmm. But in all honesty, 
um, it was it, it wasn't done well at all. And we repeatedly tried to get it right. And it was probably at that time, the most frustrating part of my business was working uh, with this factory to try and get, you know, what you would think is a simple product uh, manufactured. And lo and behold, in into my booth walks Malcolm Ainge of Shires. So <laughs> yeah. it was just, yeah, it, it was meant to be. <laughs> <laughs> so along those lines, um, it sounds like it was pretty easy, but were there challenges that you faced? Yeah. Um, challenges. There's been, you mean for getting it going or keeping it going or Both. like, let's start with, yeah. you know, getting it going. What were the challenges getting it going? Um, I guess part of it at the beginning, believe it or not, was I was a single mom for most mm-hmm. of this journey. And so you needed to get on the, you needed to get on the the trade show campaign and, and, So I would head off to trade shows with my seven and eight, you know, she would have been seven, eight up until she still comes to trade shows with me and she's 21. And it's like, come on, Jasmine, we got to go. And at the time you do think, wow, you know, my, my kid is my, my child is, you know, having to get dragged along to trade shows, but I can still go to trade shows today. And some people that have been there for long times will go, how is your daughter doing? Right. So, and the, and the things that she learned along the way, I think independence. And so that would have certainly been a challenge in the early days, um, getting product timely, um, would have certainly been an issue, uh, in the early days COVID, you know, I have another, uh, game changing product after this persuader, but COVID didn't help. So sometimes you've just got to accept that, which you cannot change, uh, Mm -hmm. be it delays in shipping, be it something's not quite right. A really big challenge is trying to break through the mentality of coaches, riders that um, look at my products and go, they may not be cool or, oh my God, I would never wear those. I actually have had a trainer at a horse show two weeks ago because uh, another product of mine is the next strap. And we can talk about that later. And he just looked at it and said, I would never let my student wear that. Hmm. And that is such a big hurdle is, and I get it. I've coached for over 30 years and, and you see trendy things and you, you know, young kids, you know, who, what's everybody wearing in the barn. And, and, and so to, to break that ceiling has been the hardest um, part of the journey and in the early days, trying to get FEI to approve that spur uh, because it is by far one of the most humane spurs on the market, and and FEI just dug in their heels, and it doesn't look traditional, and on and on it went. Amazing. And when you started out, was it a side business for you? Where did you have something else that was your main business? Yeah, it's definitely uh, it was a side business because um, I officiated. For the last nine years, nine years, I've also been the Shires rep for Canada. Yeah. So it's been a great marriage. So as I get to travel across Canada for Shires, my products come in tow. So I do both of those to this day, um, mm-hmm. you know, on a daily basis. And the Shires business is quite time consuming. My my business is quite time consuming. Um, I also, as I said, coached, officiated um, as well. So, yeah, I've always done horse things, um, multiple horse things at once. Yeah. But I was reading in your bio about you doing some pony club stuff. Mm -hmm. And I feel like one of the things that pony club gave me growing up is, um, organization. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, that, that comes into play at all with, you know, your experience? Uh, pony club or organization or pony club, like helping you have skills to kind of manage things. Um, I'm not going to say Pony Club ha- gave me any kind of skills for managing things. So again, I got my, my A level on Pony Club back in, I was 21. So that would have been back in the eighties. And I do think Pony Club was very different than as, mm-hmm. than it, than it is now. Like to get your A took three days. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it was, it was an intense three days of you, anybody that's in Pony Club knows what's involved. Yep. So I think the the skills that got me to the A level have helped me with business. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Maybe some of the things that I learned in pony club, such as, you know, when you're going up for the higher levels, you have to understand physiology and anatomy more in horses. And along with my degree, I've taken comparative vertebrate anatomy and physiology. So you understand more how everything's connected, but pony club per se, um, I, I'm a huge fan of Pony Club. I think it gives you the horse mastership skills that everybody needs if you're going to yeah. work with horses. But I wouldn't say it gave me um, any of the tools that I would have needed for business. No. Yeah, I think that's interesting, though. You just mentioned about your degree and um, utilizing that in, yeah. in making your products. Well, I got, I went to university. I, I always aspired to be on the team for eventing and I was lucky enough to be on the junior team. And, and I did go advanced when we, when we had steeplechase and I thought I wanted to be a vet and thought if I ever got hurt, I would want a degree to fall back on. And my life has always been kind of around animals. So um, I segued into wildlife biology and it, it had a lot of relevant things to, to working with horses because you have multiple nutritions and, and, and things like that. So it certainly did help with, with understanding horses better. That's really interesting. Animal behavior as well, right? That's key. Your horses are always talking. Are we listening? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> really. And that seems to be an important um, part of your business in creating products that listen more to horses and, and how they're mm-hmm. feeling. Yes, very much so. Um, It's amazing. I've been so fortunate to literally travel the world doing trade shows. I've been to Australia. I've been to Beta many times. I've been to uh, Germany, across the States and Canada. And the the stories that you hear from people when they come into your booth and you tell them what your products are about, it really is is Um, Mm eye-opening. Sometimes how little some people know about horses. or they don't understand why they're doing what they're doing, be it using a rowel spur for say, uh, for example, I, I've heard so many stories from Western amateurs about, uh, you know, I, my coach put a pair of rowels on me and my horse spooked. And I think y'all know how that ended. Um, (laughs) yeah, so it's, it's, it's just been a fascinating journey talking to people. And, you know, one of my favorite taglines, and for me, this is great, you know, a a tool for anybody for marketing is, and it's probably a question maybe later on is not pushing the sale so much as I can go to Rolex, let's say, um, and I will stand out at the front of my booth. So I have the girths hanging and, and I have a table with all my products on it. And people will be looking at my girth as they come by and you just know the wheels are turning and I'll go, come on in. The story's free. Yeah. And they look at me like, oh, okay. I'm up for a free story. And I will tell them, and I still do to this day, I'll be in at Equine Affair in Massachusetts in a couple of weeks. It's more important that you hear my story than it is for you to buy my product. Because mm. what I will do is I will plant the seed ears back, tail swishing, teeth grinding, not making the distances, going to bite you when you tack them up. That Those are signs sometimes for both spurs, spur use. And then when you're doing up a girth or riding, short striding, don't want to breathe deeply. And at least now I've planted the seed of, oh, right. That's what she was talking about. Yeah. You do want to bite me when I tack you up mm-hmm. and they just never put it together. They think it's bad behavior, you know, right. things like that. Right. So it's been a fascinating at the cause. Story. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so you started with the spurs, um, was it a natural progression to your other products? Um, and how, you know, how did you decide to be able to expand it? Well, I have to thank the off the track thoroughbreds. Um, that those, that was the breed that was always in my price point. And I have a long career of buying and selling off the racetrack. And, uh, so again, I have to thank them for being as sensitive as they are, being as talkative as they are. Uh, so the spur, you know, I saw how how effective it could be without all the negative side effects uh, of a spur. And then the last thoroughbred I bought off the racetrack, the saddle was custom for him. But when I brought the tack to his stall right away, back to the stall, head down, ears back. And I went, my God, man, you're talking loudly. Mm-hmm. I know the saddle fits. You're, you're not, you're not lame, but I'll tell you in the winter times, 
I had that, the, the traditional, you know, beautiful leather girth with the elastic at both ends, um, a pony clubber to always be clean and soft. And his canter was brutal. It was so, he didn't want to move. And I thought, am I going to have to just turn you out for the winters? Cause this is ridiculous. Anyways, I thought, okay, the girth, I'm going to change the girth. So um, again, I had experience uh, being at the racetrack for 10 years. And so on race day, um, they have a three inch elastic and I thought, okay, it's gotta be like a bra. It has to be it, let us move. It needs to um, not restrict us any, in any way, mm. or even like an elastic belt. You know, there's a great, uh, the unbelt company in, in Saskatchewan, in um, Alberta. I met, um, I met her this summer on a, on a West coast Canadian uh, uh, road trip. You know, you can put a tight leather belt on to hold up your pants now I want you to go run and jump or mm-hmm. I can put an elastic belt on you still going to hold up your pants, but it's way more comfortable. And that's how my girth is. So I thought, okay, got to have elastic in it. So it breathes and moves and you can expand and reach and do all that kind of stuff without it being restrictive. The centerpiece is key because at the racetrack, they tighten up that elastic girth really too tightly. Um, but they don't want anything moving. Right. So I thought, no, 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 it can't be all elastic. It has to have a central part that now I have an absolutely symmetrical girth and there's something to anchor it there. Um, and so I have a neoprene sternum pad and two different sizes, pony and and horse, and it will help to keep the saddle and the girth in place, but it, it allows you to not have to over tighten a girth. Um, like some people like to do, unfortunately, fleece girths, you have to tighten them up quite, uh, quite a bit so that they don't slip and all sorts of issues with some of these other traditional girths. And then leather at the ends where it's not really that important because up closest to the spine, the horse doesn't do much movement up there. It doesn't mm-hmm. do the breathing and expanding up there. It does it from the sternum up the rib cage. And so I, I took my idea to a local saddle leather maker at the time. He's now since retired. And I said, look, Brian, can you do me a favor? I got you. I, I got to make this girth. And as I'm describing it and giving him the dimensions, he actually goes, oh, I think you're onto something. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, I'll let you know after I try it. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, I get my prototype and I start putting it on that thoroughbred. and. Again, I, you know, it was kind of like the first day I, I put those, my persuader on that thoroughbred. I thought this is a big day. And I s- thought the same thing with, with magic, the name of the horse that I had at the time. I thought, oh, are you going to buck me off? Or, you know, is that going to feel this weird that, you know, you know I'm going to get some kind of reaction. And he moved the best he'd, he'd ever move. Within three weeks, he mentally wow. came around and would be waiting for me at the stall door with the tack. Wow. And it was so funny. And we used, and then we competed in jumpers in the wintertime. <clears throat> we never looked back after that. And I thought, okay, I have manufacturing in place. So, <laughs> you know, it was just get the diagrams and all the sizing and what I what I intuitively felt was correct. And it's just been an incredible and surreal journey that I'm these products can make such a difference that they do. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's amazing that it, you see the results that quickly because uh, a lot of times people have to continuously change and shift. I know um, when we had talked to Alexandra from Equifit, she was, you know, talking about all the times that they have to send it out to people and the trials and, you know, how long it takes to come to market. So to hear that you were able to get it done so quickly is quite amazing, actually. (laughs) You know, I'll tell you something. Horses want simple. They want simple bits. They want simple feet. They want simple training and they Mm -hmm. want simple tack. Mm -hmm. And that's part of, you know, when I talk about trends and gimmicks and all those kinds of things, there's lots of gimmicky girths out there now. Um, and other pieces of tack, but bottom line is the horses don't lie and they really do just want simple. And, um, another, you know, another interesting part of the business is, um, you know, not being shy and going up to people, um, just because I didn't have a sales or marketing background doesn't mean that 
you can't be confident in what you're doing. I have oodles of confidence because I know my products help. So yeah. I can approach people. One of my biggest fans, and I thank him all the time, is Bernie Traurig for my spurs. Um, he travels, you know, the U.S. doing clinics. And I know he's got persuaders in his knapsack. Because mm-hmm. when I ask people how they find out my product, uh, how they found out about it, they'll go, I was at a Bernie clinic <laughs> and he put them on me. <laughs> Stuart Pittman, uh, the, the founder of the Retired Racehorse Project, he and I crossed paths, crossed paths at a trade show in Maryland a long time ago. I, I want to say 2010 or 11. And I walked up to him as I did Bernie and I said, hey, you and I both love thoroughbreds. I designed this for the thoroughbred. Um, here, take a pair. Tell me what you think. And Stuart Pittman wrote me back uh, a couple months later and said, Linda, these are the best inventions since the snaffle bit. Um, so when you can get people on board and, and they're sincere and they can see the, the improvement with the horse, then it just makes the journey that much better. Yeah. I like the, that point, you know, you don't have to have a sales and marketing background to be able to sell your product as long as you know it and you're passionate and you get behind it and can explain it to people. So um, I really love that point because, you know, for some things, yes. Like if you need a complicated social media advertising campaign, yeah, you probably need somebody with a little experience or you need to be able to put the time in to learn how to do it. But if, you know, just getting some of those contacts and being able to really, I mean, that's what marketing is, right? Knowing who your customer is and knowing what your product is and why they fit together and, and, Mm -hmm. you know, having that passion for it really um, can do the job just as well. Yeah. Um, And then the feedback, you know, and, and the, and the stories that you can share with people afterwards. Um, Mm -hmm. I'll just give you a real quick story that brought a tear to my eye. I was out on the East Coast in Canada about three three years ago now. And it was more a Shire's call than it was my call because it was a feed store. And this gentleman, um, I don't know how we got talking about girths. He goes, is that the girth with all the elastic in it? I said, yeah. He goes, oh, let me call my girlfriend. So he calls up his girlfriend and said, you're never going to guess who's standing beside me. You know that elastic girth you love? The inventor's right here. Tell her your story. So she goes, Linda, I have this quarter horse who wants to kill me when I tack him up. It got so bad. I said to my trainer, maybe he wants to go to someone else. Linda, I have every girth on the market you can imagine to try and cure this guy. I saw your girth and went, what's one more girth? You changed my life. That's awesome. That's incredible. Yeah. (laughs) And that's, you know, why you work so hard and, you know, put in all of the hours. And I mean, being an entrepreneur, we've said is 24 seven. And that's why you kill yourself to, (laughs) to try and because, you know, it's a good product and you've seen it help people and horses. And, you know, it's not just making money for yourself and being able to support yourself. It's, it's also trying to make a difference and Mm -hmm. that's really cool to hear. Do you find that you get uh, stories internationally as well? Yeah, I get people emailing me all the time and it's really quite neat. Um, You'd have to look, you'd have to look on my Instagram page. There's a section on testimonials and there's, there's ones there from around the world. One of my brand ambassadors is Jane Turney, who um, is a rider just underneath Charlotte Dujardin. And Mm -hmm. she's been in my girth now for a couple of years. And she said, just the movement that I get with, with my horses in your girth, Linda. Um, So yeah, there's lots of different testimonials and the, and it, it can be about riding. It can even be the tacking up experience. I have one from a woman who said, Linda, my horse was antsy and biting me on cross ties for 15 years. Mm. Stopped with your girth. Wow. You know, just even stories like that make my heart sing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, obviously the, the parallels, I think, between Canada and the U.S. are 
fairly common. I think the sport is is pretty alike in both countries. Um, did you? When did you realize that you needed to expand beyond North America, and how did you take those steps? So when you have a website, uh, and I use Shopify, it's very easy to sell internationally. Um, Mm -hmm. So that was easy to do. And the biggest help for me selling internationally is having people in different countries that have become distributors. Mm -hmm. So I have in the Netherlands, uh, Riza Fleischer, who is a saddle fitter. And I'll tell you, saddle fitters can be the best retailers for, for, uh, for a business. Yeah. You're looking at horses, you're fitting saddles. If they still aren't right, guess what? The last part of the equation is the girth. Yeah. So I, you know, I was able to go and do international trade shows and meet some key people that became and and are distributors for me, comfy horse in the UK. Um, it's always it, you're always trying to grow again. I had a lovely girl in Germany. Um, she reached out to me and said, Hey, I'm always looking for new products. Can I, I'm going to get one of your girths and, and see what I think. Anyways, about six weeks later, she writes me back and goes, I didn't even think my horse had a girth issue, but it's canter was so much better with your girth. Can I distribute these for you? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I said, like, sure you can. And so <laughs> my manufacturing is set up such that you can get my product direct through manufacturing. Okay. So I made it easy for distributors to come on board that way. So. Again, reaching out to people, you know, um, I, I did German on my website because mm-hmm. that's a, that can be such a big market. Um, I still do need more distributors. I need one in Germany. I'd love to have one in France. But again, it's just kind of breaking through that ceiling of, wow, these look different. Mm-hmm. That's that's the constant challenge for me is, guys, isn't your, your horse's well-being, comfort, and performance more important than what everybody else might be using or you would think, (laughs) but that's the heart. That's going to be quite frankly, the hardest part of this journey. The horses don't lie, you know, and I get it, you know, it's no different than a, a, you know, like a, a, a bit, let's say that bit won't necessarily work on every single horse, but it'll get to the majority of them. And that's how my girth is. Yes. You'll have the odd horse. Unfortunately, if they're incredibly thin skin, possibly get rubbed, My thoroughbred that I did this for was very thin skinned, never caused him any issues. Um, Some horses are just really stoic and I guess they take, you know, everything, but yeah, it's just breaking through that, that, that um, thinking of, wow, these look different. (laughs) Can you explain a little bit about the, what you mentioned just now about the direct to market manufacturing and what that means and how it works? So any of my international distributors, they place the order with me, then Mm -hmm. I send in the order to Shires and product will get manufactured and then shipped to them directly. So it's easy, very seamless. So so you don't have to have the inventory and send it to them. It comes directly from whoever makes it so that there's less middlemen, less time, less money. Yes, it's very, very seamless. Um, I can ship, I have a, I rent a storage unit, which has inventory in it. Um, and I can ship to, to direct to all my retailers mm-hmm. uh, in the States and in Canada, but anywhere in Europe, I will direct them either to the Netherlands or the UK. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's been probably the biggest um, or the, you know, the easiest way for you to to expand outside of North America. Yeah. Bring on other distributors, more people that can help you build the brand. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So you've got to go to international trade shows. I was just at beta uh, Mm -hmm. three weeks ago and I was with my UK distributor, you know, trying to grow the, the, the brand for her in the UK. Mm -hmm. Do you have minimums that they have to order? Uh, There's minimum size runs. Okay. So it's not like they have to take huge amounts. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to order a certain size, you need to do a minimum order of that size. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. And um, what are some of the challenges that you have selling internationally? So another challenge for growing it internationally is when you do reach out to some of the top riders, let's say, 
some riders don't care what Olympian or top rider uses your product. They just want to know if it works for their horse. Other customers, well, who's using it, right? Mm -hmm. So unfortunately with a girth, a lot of top riders are sponsored by saddle manufacturers. And if they're sponsored by a saddle manufacturer, they have to use that company's girth, whether it's the best thing for that horse or not. So that's been a huge, um, and I've contacted some very big riders and they'll write back and go, sorry, Lynn, I'm sponsored. So I can't use it. I might be able to train with it, but you, I, they can't even say they train with it. Right. Yeah. So it defeats the purpose kind of, of <laughs> you being able to use their testimonial and how it works mm -hmm. for their horses. And mm -hmm. yeah. Do you think when you get FaceTime in Europe and you go over to the trade shows that helps um, push your, your product since you're the person and, and you're so passionate about it? Yeah, absolutely. Malcolm of Shire has always said that. Oh, Linda, I wish I could duplicate you because nobody tells your story better than you. <laughs> so yeah, for sure. They get the passion um, and, and why I did it. And Oh, I have so many stories, right? Mm -hmm. and, and really, this is this is the biggest thing I think I would tell people that if you have a business idea and you don't have sales experience, be a good storyteller. Really, mm -hmm. that because then your then your 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 passion and your conviction comes through, and that's really what I do. I have hundreds of stories. I could, tell me what your horse does. Great. I can tell you what, you know, somebody told me their horse did, you know, I had a coach come up to me once at a big uh, Ontario horse show and went, Oh my God, Guppy never gets five in the five line, but he got it this time wearing your girth, <laughs> you <laughs> know, things like that. And, yeah. Yeah. And one of my brand ambassadors, uh, Gabriel, he's from Brazil. I, I got, I got a phone call probably two years ago. I'm looking for the owner of tapestry girths. I said, that's me. And he said, oh, thank God I found you. I have one of my friends down here in Wellington. He's been telling me, uh, telling me about this elastic girth and how it's calmed his mare down. I need to get some girths. So anyways, sent him with, with some girths. And it just changed his one horse in the ring, you know, from an from a anxiety point of view. So he's got probably 12 of them now in his barn and he's one of my ambassadors because it, mm. it just changed his horse. Mm. Do you think you have a, an exact strategy, how you're approaching your international sales or you're kind of letting it grow as you can and making contacts? You know what? I, it's going to be more of the latter than the, than the former. And maybe that's not good or bad. Um, but yeah, you, you just constantly reach out to people. I'll see an in, interesting Facebook post or an Instagram post and I'll message to them and say, Hey, um, maybe have a look at my website. It might be a product that you're interested in. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's, it's, it's not absolutely structured. I'll be honest. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you think the best advice you can give uh, our listeners about um, international sales and international business? Okay. So what, one thing I uh, would definitely say is when you've got people coming on as distributors for you in different countries, let them price the product. Mm -hmm. I have a, a minimum price. You guys can't go below that, but guess what? You know, Germany best, you know, the UK best, you know what your market will bear you guys price it. So I have nothing to do with pricing for them. So I would help. I would, I would suggest that just because I don't live there. Um, you know, the, you know, I had been told I lived in Germany a, a long time ago, you know, sometimes the Europeans think if it's more expensive, it's a better product. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, let them, let them work with their market. Um, for example, in Europe, they want more blackers than they want Havana. I didn't realize that because we take more Havana here in North America than we do black. So, you know, you need people that are obviously quite familiar with the industry over there to even guide you or make suggestions. Um, trade shows are key because you're going to meet other retailers. You might meet some key riders. Hmm. So yeah, you've, you've got, it's got to be multifaceted. I'm going to WESA in January. So that's the big U S trade show to try and bring on yet again, more U S uh, tax stores. Um, a very good friend of mine, uh, and her name will be mentioned later, Nicole Verkint, um, great businesswoman up here in Ontario. 
she always told me, Linda, 10 years to be an overnight sensation. Yeah. I think that more than once in a day. (laughs) (laughs) We had someone say that um, you'll probably be in business and successful in five years. You'll see imitations, uh, you know, people imitating your products. Have you noticed that? Yours? So I do have the Canadian, US, and European patents. Um, Okay. So, yes, um, I've had a couple of instances and I try and jump on them rather quickly Mm -hmm. uh, because this is this. My products have been a passion. They've come out of a lot of hard work and sweat and money. And it I I take great offense to anyone trying to copy it. And Mm -hmm. I think anybody that's invented a product that's unique and uh, it works would feel exactly the same way. Some people go, well, isn't that the ultimate form of flattery? Well, you know what? I don't really need that flattery. (laughs) (laughs) I would rather Um, have the sales. Thank you. Yeah. (laughs) And it's kind of neat. You know, I had a a rider that uses my product. Give me a heads up about Mm -hmm. a a person that was contemplating it. And so, yeah, um, I guess it's out there. But um, because it's been on the market for as long as it has, you have trademark recognition and yeah. I, do, I have, I have the patents on it for all those regions. So um, yeah, that's really important. I don't think a lot of people would maybe realize, you know, what they can patent and, um, and how to go about that was a, a difficult process. Well, I had it done for this persuader. So mm-hmm. I'd already met the law firm that I would deal with for that patent. So I knew what needed to be done. The hardest thing is are the drawings and, and what is specific about your products um, that you're patenting. And so essentially the my entire girth is patented. So the the elastic, the the center piece, all that is are are part of my my patents. So no, not really. And it they're expensive to get, but um, they're a necessity. I think yeah. they're a huge, a huge. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Deterrent to anybody wanting to copy your product. Um, I've got, you know, I've got a legal team, you know, as yeah. as as needed. How long? No, that's really to important get, to get the patents. Um, some were quicker. Um, some took a little bit longer. Uh, I don't think COVID helped. COVID put a lot of things on the back burner for lots of different industries, but as long as you've got a patent submitted, which I do, I, you know, I've had patents on my GER for six, seven years now, then you're protected. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and was, what step in the process did you start the patent? Like, right. Like after you did your prototype and you were using it yourself, did you go and start it? Or was it like when you knew you were coming to market or after you took it? Before? Before I took it to market. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. there could be somebody who saw a prototype and was like, ooh, and rushed to market before you. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So no, everything was patented before it got to market. Great idea. No, I think that's really good advice because I don't think a lot of people would think to start it that early. They would wait and see, you know, before <laughs> investing the money to patent it. No, I and I, I totally understand what you're saying there, but I saw how effective they both were, the spur and the, and the girth. So I knew they were going to work. That wasn't the issue. Um, and let me just correct myself, patented or patent pending? Because right. it can take a couple of years for patents to come through, but as long as they're submitted and you have a date. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> well, it was so cool talking to you about your products and your journey um, to market and how you brought them internationally. And I think there was a lot of great advice in there for people who listen and hope it can help them. Um, So we thank you for coming on and talking with us. Well, thank you guys for letting me share the story. Um, It's obviously an important one for me and for the horses. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I know I have a I just got in a two-year-old thoroughbred off the track. So I'll be looking at your girths today, <laughs> this afternoon. Well and I don't know if I'll need spurs quite yet, but definitely <laughs> I think a girth is in order. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so at the end of each episode, we ask the same questions to each guest and Connor mm-hmm. starts with the first one. Okay, Linda, what is one action that women can take to make a big difference in their lives? I think you need to empower yourself. Um, 
That is the biggest thing. And don't let other people say no for you. My, my, one of my biggest mottos is no. So what, what's, what's worst case scenario. Somebody says no to you. Big deal. Move on. Believe in yourself. Yeah. And what is the best habit that keeps you motivated personally? Uh, The best habit would have to be every day you're working your business. Every day you're talking to a potential new customer, be it retailer or end user. Um, You're doing something with your your social media. You're doing something to let people know, guess what? I'm out there and you need to have a look at me. So be consistent. Okay. And what's your favorite horse movie? Uh, Man from Snowy River. Uh, That's a good one. (laughs) <laughs> I love the soundtrack to that movie. Yeah. <laughs> Great. And who would you recommend to be a future guest on this podcast? Well, again, I've mentioned her name and she's been a great mentor for me in business. Um, she doesn't have a horse business per se, but she is an equestrian. And that would be yeah. Nicole Kent. Um, I used to coach her and her daughters, uh, her, her and her sister, Um 20 years ago. And she was recognized as one of Canada's top 40 under 40. She's a venture capitalist. Um, And I will bounce ideas off Nicole and go, what do you think of this? Or what do you think of that? And, you know, we just had a conversation a couple of weeks ago. She goes, Linda, you have to help people understand your, your products aren't cool, but they're cool for your horse. You know what I mean? Like that, you know, and so we'll go back and forth on, okay, well, this is how I have to reframe this idea or, or that thought. And so she's again, 10 years to be an overnight sensation. I have her in the back of my head um, and just say, look, you can do it. You can do it, Linda. That's That's awesome. I love that you have someone to talk to about that who has, I don't, you know, horse experience is obviously very important in our industry, but you know, business experience transcends Mm -hmm. industries. And Mm -hmm. it's so great to have somebody like that, that you can talk to. Yeah. Awesome. We would love to talk to her too, if she's willing. (laughs) For sure. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It was great talking to you. Thank you again, ladies. Lovely to have met you and thank you for giving me the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. What an interesting conversation we had today talking to Linda. I think that it was kind of eye opening to talk about the international markets and you know um the patent part of it was really uh important for people mm-hmm. to learn about to listen to for me to learn about i just i thought she was a very interesting person and um her storytelling was excellent yeah you can tell she's like she said you know i stand outside the booth and talk to people and um and that's how I get them to buy my products. I'm like, yep, I can exactly see why. Like she's that type of person that draws you in and and has the not only the stories from people, but she has that background knowledge of horses and that wealth of information of working with horses her whole life that she can um, you know, say why her products work and be able to sell the product in that way. And, you know, she says she has no sales and marketing, you know, education and stuff like that. But I think just her personality makes her uh, a natural salesperson. Oh, absolutely. Natural salesperson and her confidence in her products and that they Mm. work. Yeah. That goes a long way, right? When you, when you know that something works and it's, it's not like you're forcing a sale, you're telling the truth really. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I'm sure that genuine quality comes through with everyone who meets her. And then immediately, I mean, you did the same thing. You're like, well, I got to go buy a girth for my new <laughs> thoroughbred. <laughs> right. Yeah. I was like, mm, noted that, that it's going to help him. Okay. So yeah, I mean, she, and, and I think it's interesting too, because when she was talking about trying to expand into the other countries that um, even the Shire's guy had said to her, he wished that he could clone her because she is so natural at it. And I'm sure that if she did have the opportunity to be face to face with more people in other countries, she probably would gain even more traction there Mm -hmm. because she's just that personable. And she just really comes across as somebody who's not a pitchy salesperson, but genuinely Mm -hmm. believes she's helping the horse, which is ultimately what everybody wants. Yeah. And I think, you know, she 
by this time with as many years as her products have been out, she she has the feedback and the anecdotes from people who've used it that it's absolutely changed their horse. And that's so cool to see that, you know, you think you have an idea and you don't really know if it's going to work, you know, even if it works on your horse, that doesn't mean it'll work on anyone else's horse. And for her to get that type of feedback is, um, I'm sure, extremely fulfilling. And like we said a few times, like sets her, she knows she's on the right path of what she's doing. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, for products like hers that can span disciplines and obviously cross borders and can be sold anywhere in the world. It was interesting to see how she was able to, you know, determine manufacturing and um, how she gets her sales reps in different countries. And, you know, she was very adamant about, you know, you need somebody local who knows what they like and how they deal and what price they'll pay. And that was really interesting to hear. Um, you know, how she's able to go into those markets and be successful because she finds people who know what it's like there. Yeah. I think that's really important point that she made. I also think that her kind of being on top of knockoffs mm. is really also a good point that she made that she's mm -hmm. built good relationships with people that can kind of help her navigate uh, when there are products that are going to be knockoffs coming mm -hmm. so she can kind of nip that at a time. Uh, and just the overall, um, ex how it fell into place for her, yeah. right? Like yeah. I, it, I was expecting it to be like, Oh, what were your challenges? And it was so difficult. And she was like, Oh, <laughs> No, nope, but this happened, this happened, boom, boom, boom. And I was like, yeah, if there if there's ever somebody to have some things just line up because it's the right thing, I I, I think it's her. <laughs> yeah, that was funny because I did. Yeah, I too thought it would be like years long of trekking to tax shops and all that. <laughs> She's like, boom, I got it done. I'm like, awesome. I love yeah. to hear that. <laughs> yeah, like in a year, it just boom, like, yeah. you know, things fell into place and all the worlds collided and it made it happen. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh, I mean, I had all these questions built up that I was going to be like, oh, <laughs> what was the struggle? And what was, the, how, how'd you break in? And she was like, oh no, this guy came in and boom, it was done. <laughs> So I love that. I love that about her because I, I feel like yeah. she brings a positive spirit mm -hmm. too. So it's it's good to see good things happen to, to good people like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was a great conversation today and we're going to call it a wrap. Find the links to today's guests and the show notes at www.eqbusinesswomen.com. Equestrian B2B is out twice a month on the 1st and the 15th. You can find out more at eqbusinesswomen.com and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Find Equestrian B2B wherever you get your podcasts and be sure to follow, subscribe, and leave a review. You can have all 20 plus shows of the Horse Radio Network with you wherever you go with their free app for iPhone and Android. Go to your app store and search Horse Radio Network. Now go tell your story.